Okay, let's um, continue our examination of uh, hunger, uh, this time focus a little bit more on the biology of hunger. Uh, and uh, we'll be going over, you know, certain classic experiments that have been done uh, in this area. Uh, and you already know a little bit about the biology as viewed through um, uh, the understanding of a disorder, an eating disorder like anorexia. But let's now try to complete the picture here now in terms of what we know about the underlying biology of our eating behavior. So clearly, you know, there are habits and customs that um, uh, influence our eating behavior. Um, certainly, um, we're, you know, probably the only mammalian species that, that eats more than what we really need to at any given moment in time. Uh, but there are both learned factors and unlearned factors that contribute to our, to our eating behavior, you know, habits and customs. I mean, in our country, we're used to eating three meals a day. Our large meal tends to be in the evening. In European countries, on the other hand, um, uh, the large meal tends to be at noontime. A uh, smaller meal in the evening. Uh, in certain Asian cultures, uh, people uh, there are uh, seems like they're constantly eating a lot of small meals uh, throughout the day. So certainly, um, you know, habits, customs, cultural factors uh, play a role in our eating behavior. We don't want to minimize those things, but this is a, a course in the study of um, uh, the biology of behavior. So we're going to be focusing in on those biological factors. Uh, clearly, that study that we talked about um, uh, earlier, um, uh, anorexia nervosa in the Fiji Islands, and how it uh, dramatically escalated um, uh, once an American television program came in. And, um, uh, you know, you have these images um, in these television programs of very thin uh, women. So this, this disorder uh, uh, increased uh, in, in Fiji, where, in fact, uh, prior to this time, there had been very little uh, uh, incidence of this eating disorder. So, again, I don't want to minimize these factors, the uh, cultural factors. Uh, as playing a role. They certainly do play a role. Um, but... Uh, uh, what I want to do is to focus more on the biology of this um, uh, aspects of, aspect of motivation. So when we look at our digestive system, our digestive system is meant to break down the food uh, that we eat, break it down into smaller molecules uh, so that our cells uh, will be replenished and we can use that. Um, in the, the mouth, there are enzymes in saliva that break down carbohydrates. In the stomach, uh, hydrochloric acid digests uh, proteins. Uh, so, you know, this uh, digestive system obviously is playing a very important role in terms of breaking down food. Um, the small and large intestine, the small intestine has very specialized enzymes that are digesting things like uh, protein. Uh, and fat, carbohydrate, it gets absorbed uh, uh, into the bloodstream. The large intestine, uh, on the other hand, is principally involved in absorbing water and minerals, and it lubricates those materials that ultimately are going to be passed on as feces. So again, small and large intestine playing you know, uh, an important role. Um, here's an interesting uh, little sidelight here that I want to just spend a little bit of time on, and that is, uh, you know, the role of uh, lactase. Um, lactase is an intestinal enzyme, uh, and you really, you need it in order to metabolize lactose. Uh, and uh, lactose um, is found in a lot of dairy products, and milk in particular. Uh, it's the, the sugar uh, that's found um, in those dairy products. Um, milk consumption after weaning generally causes um, gas and stomach cramps. You have declining levels of lactase uh, that may be an evolutionary mechanism to encourage uh, uh, weaning uh, to occur and animals uh, eating on their own, human beings eating on their own. Uh, human adults have enough lactase to consume milk uh, and other dairy products in order to break down uh, what's there uh, generally throughout their lifetime, but in certain populations, uh, they don't have enough. If you take a look at a phenomenon called lactose intolerance, uh, we see this uh, in uh, many uh, 
Chinese uh, individuals uh, in countries uh, where they lack the gene uh, that uh, allows you to metabolize lactose. So in those countries then, they can only have very small quantities of dairy products uh, be because again, they, they don't have the ability to metabolize uh, lactose. Uh, now, another, you know, basic um, differentiating feature here is carnivore herbivores and omnivores. Uh, carnivores uh, are eating meat. Uh, they find the uh, vitamins uh, that they need in the meat that they consumed. Uh, certainly, the uh, lions that you see here are carnivores. Herbivores, like the deer that you see here, uh, they eat uh, exclusively plants, and then omnivores, uh, like birds, for example, eat both uh, meat and plants. Uh, you know, how do we go about self-selecting foods? I mean, this is an, an interesting uh, area of research, um, you know, self-selection uh, in the field of uh, behavioral neuroscience and nutrition. You know, how do we find uh, vitamins and minerals? What are, what are the keys to this in terms of our development and um, um, uh, finding things that are that are that are edible and that are going to help us in terms of um, uh, nutritionally going to help us in terms of these essential vitamins and minerals? Well. Oftentimes, it's accomplished by way of imitation, by way of modeling. What we see other people um, eating, and in the case of lower animals, what other uh, animals in the same species see uh, uh, what, their, uh, what their parents eat, uh, for example. Um, so there are strategies that are involved in self-selection. Uh, we tend to like sweet foods. We tend to avoid bitter foods. Again, this is seen in almost all mammals. Uh, we prefer things that taste familiar to us. We learn from consequences uh, when a food is consumed. Uh, if there's associated with illness, we, it can develop uh, conditioned taste aversion, so we avoid it in the future. Uh, there's learning that takes place during fetal life. During the last three months of fetal life, there's some wonderful studies that have been done showing that uh, pregnant women who consume certain substances like uh, uh, garlic and carrot juice, those are things that are going to be uh, preferred later on by their uh, offspring. So indeed, there's learning that's going on. So again, all these factors are involved in uh, cell selection. Uh, there are peripheral mechanisms for hunger. Um, you know, the brain is regulating uh, messages that are coming from a lot of different parts of our body, from the mouth, from the stomach, from the intestines, from fat cells. Um, they're, they're all playing a role, these peripheral mechanisms. Uh, taste, uh, mouth sensations like chewing, for example. These two are motivating factors in terms of uh, our eating behavior and in terms of the signals that are involved in uh, uh, telling us uh, to, to stop eating. Uh, there are some interesting sham feeding experiments that were done in this area a number of years ago in which uh, the, everything that an animal uh, was eating would leak out by way of these tubes that were implanted. Here is a, uh, a, a esophageal tube that you see right here, or uh, in the stomach, uh, a tube that you see right here. Uh, so in other words, uh, the food uh, was not allowed uh, really to um, uh, uh, completely uh, go through the digestive system. And one of the things that we know is that in these sham feeding experiments, uh, even though uh, these, uh, in some cases it was done with humans, in other cases it was done with animals, it does not produce satiety. So animals essentially would keep eating and eating and eating and eating. They would never satiate. Um, so that indicates that there must be, you know, some other mechanisms that are involved, namely uh, brain mechanisms that are involved. Uh, that are uh, in these sham feeding experiments, that information is never really getting to the brain. So these experiments indicate that the coordinating area, you know, for our eating behavior is, is obviously in the brain. There are signals, certainly, that come from our stomach. Uh, some of the uh, main signals uh, are when our stomach uh, is distended uh, after eating. 
Uh, the vagus nerve is conveying information about stretching of the stomach walls. That information goes up the spinal cord to the brain. Uh, the splanchnic nerve, uh, on the other hand, is conveying information about uh, the actual nutrient contents of the stomach, and that too is going to, to the brain. And Again, we're going to focus on those brain areas that are involved. Um, the duodenum uh, that we see right here, uh, this is, uh, uh, again, part of the small intestine. There's a lot of absorption that is taking place in terms of uh, various nutrients, and it's occurring there. Um, when the duodenum is distended, that can also produce feelings of fullness um, and satiety. Uh, the duodenum also releases um, a very important appetite hormone, which is called CCK. Uh, and that, uh, when that is secreted, that helps to suppress uh, hunger. Uh, CCK stimulates digestion of fat, and it stimulates digestion of uh, protein. So again, important role being played by uh, the duodenum. Uh, the control of hunger. Again, we look at these interacting factors of glucose, insulin, and glucagon. Let's take a look at this little chart that you see here. When you're in a situation where you're experiencing low blood glucose, uh, that's going to cause the release uh, from uh, 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 or signal the pancreas uh, that these glucagon um, uh, that glucagon needs to be released by these alpha cells uh, of the pancreas. Um, uh, that we see here, and that in turn is going to prompt the liver to release glucose into the blood. So again, when you're in a period of glucose deficit, this is the chain of events that occurs in terms of the release of glucagon and its conversion uh, uh, to glucose. And again, that's going to get into the blood and you're going to achieve a normal uh, balance. In a period of high blood glucose, as you see here, its impact upon the pancreas is to uh, increase uh, insulin release by beta cells. Uh, and those uh, fat cells are going to take in uh, glucose from the blood. And then uh, we're going to get, again, uh, achieve a balance here in terms of normal glucose levels. Glucose, um, again, most digestive food, you know, that's, that's the major fuel for the brain. Uh, major fuel for our body is, is glucose. So when you're in a high glucose level, your liver is converting uh, this into glycogen. Uh, fat cells, you know, our adipose tissue is going to convert it to fat. When you're low glucose, the liver is converting glycogen back to glucose. So again, this is the, these are the fundamental relationships here that are involved uh, between glucose, uh, blood glucose, uh, and uh, our, our um, ultimately our eating behavior and our feelings of hunger and satiety. Uh, so again, insulin and hunger, pancreatic, uh, this, is a, this is a very important pancreatic hormone that enables glucose to enter the cell. Uh, insulin levels rise, so you get uh, ready for a meal, and it certainly occurs after a meal as well. So high levels of insulin essentially are, are decreasing uh, our appetite. Another recently discovered hormone that is, plays uh, a very important role here is this um, a hormone that's in uh, fat cells called leptin. And um, this is uh, referred to as lipostatic control. Uh, and it's really involved in our long-term uh, regulation of our eating behavior. Uh, here's some interesting uh, models for studying this. Uh, this is a mouse that you see here that is leptin uh, deficient. Uh, and again, these are uh, genetically manipulated animals such that they have no leptin. And what happens is uh, they just eat and eat and eat and eat. Uh, again, this is a normal mouse here with normal levels uh, of leptin. So when leptin gets low, that is stimulating you to engage in eating behavior. So long-term regulation then um, is in part related uh, to these fat supplies in our body. Uh, leptin is all part of that. Those fat cells produce that, that hormone, and that's signaling our brain to increase or decrease our eating behavior. 
the low levels of leptin increase feelings of hunger and they stimulate our, our eating behavior. Uh, so some of the research that's been done in this area is really focused in, obviously, on the underlying uh, brain mechanisms that are receiving all this information from the periphery. And that part of the brain is a part that we call the arcuate uh, area of the brain. That's This is the arcuate area that we see here. It's a part of the hypothalamus. And it contains two different sets of um, neurons, those that are sensitive to hunger signals and those that are sensitive to satiety signals. So one of the things that we know then is that these, uh, these two areas, the ventral medial hypothalamus that we see here, and again, this is all bilateral. Here's one hemisphere, here's the other. Uh, ventral medial hypothalamus that you see in the purple and the lateral hypothalamus that you see here in the red. Here's the third ventricle of the brain right here. Um, these areas are very much involved in, in terms of our eating behavior. And um, focusing in on, on some of that research uh, is, is important for understanding it. Um, if you take a look at the role of the lateral hypothalamus, uh, one of the things that we know is that the lateral hypothalamus is involved in controlling insulin and it's also very much involved in controlling uh, taste uh, responsiveness. If an animal is damaged in the lateral hypothalamus, and we can do this surgically, and there's been elegant experiments that have been done in this area by a uh, physiological psychologist by the name of Alan Epstein. When you damage the lateral hypothalamus, you do it uh, by way of uh, electrolytic lesion, for example, uh, an animal will become what we call aphasic and adipsic, meaning that they will neither eat food or will they drink water. And indeed, you have to uh, force feed them for a period of time uh, in order to get them to, to stay alive. They refuse food and water. Um, if you force feed them, uh, they will stay alive and then they will regulate their eating behavior and their drinking behavior, but a much, much lower level. So these experiments have helped us to understand that the lateral hypothalamus uh, very much is involved in our eating behavior, that, it, that it's involved in stimu ordinarily stimulating our eating behavior. Um, the ventral medial nucleus, on the other hand, uh, also is serving uh, a very important uh, function. This animal that you see here that's become, this rat has become grossly obese. It has had its ventral medial nucleus removed. This is a normal rat that you see here. And one of the things that we know is that in this animal that no longer has its ventral medial nucleus is uh, that it overeats, right? And a normal 200 gram rat after a period of about 60 days will weigh um, uh, two to three times uh, what a normal rat would weigh here in the blue. Okay. Um, what you can see is that food intake is dramatically increasing in that animal that has experienced that ventral medial nucleus. There's no longer this inhibitory control on eating behavior. Normally, uh, a rat will eat about 10 to 15 grams of food a day that you see here. But in the case of an animal that has had its ventral medial nucleus removed, they eat far, uh, far more, two to three times more uh, than what a normal rat uh, would eat. So we know that damage to this area leads to overeating, it leads to weight gain. We know that damage to that area uh, elevates um, the, the uh, uh, size uh, of the meal. Um, uh, and uh, animals uh, have uh, uh, much more uh, uh, frequent meals uh, as a consequence of this. So um, you're getting increased stomach secretions and uh, the stomach is empty and faster than usual. Uh, and damage to the ventral medial nucleus is actually increasing insulin production. And a lot of the meal is being stored uh, as fat. So again, this is very important. Uh, um, this the information on the lateral hypothalamus and the ventral medial hypothalamus. And indeed, there's been a lot of clinical work done too, uh, showing uh, in human beings, for example, that have damage to these areas. You get things very similar to what you see uh, in the case uh, of uh, uh, lower animal uh, experimental work that has been done.
Um, so let's just summarize a little bit in terms of these appetite hormones before we uh, move on uh, to another topic. We have insulin uh, being secreted by the pancreas, that's controlling blood glucose. We have leptin uh, from our fat cells, uh, it's involved in this long-term regulation of our eating behavior. Um, and uh, again, high levels uh, of leptin are, uh, are causing uh, satiation. Uh, low levels uh, cause uh, eating behavior. Orexin, a hormone that we didn't really talk about too much, but is produced in the brain, uh, but it uh, triggers, um, uh, again, it's a hormone that's triggered uh, uh, in the hypothalamus, and it too is involved in our uh, long-term control of eating behavior. Uh, ghrelin, uh, that's a hormone that's secreted by an empty stomach. Uh, it's sending uh, messages to the brain that uh, hunger messages, that is to engage in eating behavior. Uh, PYY, another appetite hormone, um, it's a digestive, digestive tract hormone, uh, and that essentially is sending to the brain, I'm not hungry uh, uh, signals. And CCK from the duodenum, uh, that is a uh, generally is a hunger suppressant. So um, now you know a little bit more about the, the biochemistry of our eating behavior, this regulation that occurs in the brain, uh, in the in the hypothalamus, um, these uh, uh, satiety uh, uh, network, um, the ventral medial hypothalamus and the lateral hypothalamus that uh, that are generally are coordinating um, our eating behavior. So we'll begin to move on now to, a, to another uh, motivated behavior. We'll be taking a look uh, at uh, sexual motivation and, uh, and aggressive motivation. That will be in uh, our, our next lectures.